Hey everybody, it's Dr. Joe here on this Wednesday evening. I hope you are fine wherever you are and uh, you're having a great day. Anyway, it's very, uh, the weather is uh, getting warmer over here now, so it's not so bad and uh, and so on. So today we're going to be talking about Section 8 housing. And I'm going to try and share with you some of my um, experiences, my tips, my suggestions, having been a participant in this program. Technically, I'm a how what they call a housing provider. I'm a housing provider for about 35 years now in the Section 8 program. So uh, I, I know about this program very well. I know the good, the bad, the ugly. I've had my trials and tribulations participate in this program. And hopefully today I'll share with you some of my um, uh, my experiences, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, and hopefully provide you with some guidance. And so that way you can, uh, you know, be a, a beneficiary of this. Uh, this it's a, it's a really good program. It's about 100, I think it's a $130 billion program. It's the largest uh, uh, rental assistance program in the country. It's, uh, it's funded by uh, the federal government through the HUD, uh, Housing and Urban Development Department. And it's administered locally through uh, what we call public housing administer, uh, <clears throat> authorities at the local level. So since it's a federal program, <coughs> uh, there is a, a housing authority in uh, you know, everywhere throughout the United States. So, uh, OK, so let's, uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so the question, uh, the first question is going to be, you know, why should landlords like yourself, uh, you know, consider uh, being a part of this program and, uh, you know, why? Well, the section, I'll, I'll do the basics first and, and then we'll do a deep dive a bit later on. But essentially, uh, you know, the Sex State program officially is called the Housing Choice Voucher Program, HCVP. Okay. Uh, it used to be called Sex State, but they kind of changed it a few years ago to Housing Choice Voucher. It's a federally funded program, like I mentioned before. And it's designed to assist low-income families, um, you know, to provide or at least live in decent, safe, and sanitary housing. I mean, that's the whole goal here. Um, you know, many years ago, governments used to own these uh, projects, and where you know uh, where the tenants would live, and they changed it around, uh, whereby they wanted to get private uh, private uh, housing providers involved, and so they issued. Uh, so they want to get out of the project business and give it to the private sector. And so they gave tenants who participate in the program a voucher to find housing, uh, you know, uh, on the local market, private market. So that's essentially the backdrop to this. So as a landlord, uh, you participate in this program, you know, um, you know, you can make money and also you can make a difference in people's life if you if that's important to you. Uh, so there is a, a social component to this thing. Uh, but again, a lot of people, all they care about is the money, the financial side, but me, I like the, the financial side and the, the social side as well. The fact that I'm making a, a huge difference in other people's lives. So, uh, so the, the, the government's involvement, um, is, or the housing authority's involvement is to provide you, the landlord with uh, timely, consistent, um, rent payments. Um, you know, and, uh, so if you accept a voucher holder or a person who has a voucher and into your property, then as part of the agreement you have with the PALS public housing uh, uh, authority locally is that you have what we call a HAP contract. And the HAP contract, uh, is a binding contract between you and you as the housing provider and the housing authority where they will uh, agree to provide you with um, monthly rental payments uh, in exchange for you, uh, you know, living up to your responsibilities. So uh, it does uh, give you that consistent payment. And uh, I have never in 30, over 30, nearly 35 years, never, ever, uh, there's never been the time where I've had a voucher holder in my house and I didn't get the rent. So, uh, you know, through good times, bad times, recessions, government shutdowns, there's never been a month ever in over 30 years where I didn't get my money. So it's a very, very stable, very, very reliable income stream as a landlord. And, uh, and also, it, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. 
And there are a lot of myths and misconceptions about this program. Uh, you know, usual stuff. You know, they're going to trash my house. You know, collect a rent with a, I don't know, bulletproof vest. You know, you got to go to get your money. Guns blazing. You know, crack dealers everywhere. It's, I mean, all the stereotypes you hear about Section 8. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying there's a lot of families out there who don't conform with those stereotypes. And um, so uh, and one thing I like about it is that uh, if you pick the right tenant, which I'll talk about later on, uh, it's a very stable pool of, of tenants. Uh, they long term, they stay a long time. And, um, you know, and uh, in fact, I think I've shared with you, my longest tenant, believe it or not, uh, has been with me 27 years, 27 years, um, you know, as and that is unheard of. And I regularly have 15, 20 year tenants. And uh, these are in markets like the DC market where the rents are four, five, six thousand dollars. That is almost unbelievable. Um, you know, if you're going to rent to a private tenant, because most ten most tenants, if they're paying three, four, five, six thousand bucks a month, at some point they're gonna say, This is crazy, let's go buy our own house. But that's not the case with uh, housing choice voucher tenants because for the most part, they're not going to be able to afford, especially if you live in an expensive market, uh, you know, to be able to bought, uh, buy these houses. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, and, and as you know, turnover costs are extremely expensive for us, especially if you are in a single family space. So if you can limit your turnover, then you can, um, uh, you know, it can reduce your uh, your outlays and therefore the cash flow that you make every month stays in your pocket. That's why I love about this program. And uh, so I'm going to kind of de debunk some of the myths associated with this program uh, as I go through the, uh, the you know, this today's live stream. So first thing is to understand some of the basics. And the question, I suppose, is, uh, you know, um, what are some of the fundamentals associated with this program? So at its core, as I said before, it's a government subsidized program and where the money goes directly to you uh, as a landlord and by the government each month. And the tenant is responsible for the remaining balance. So, for example, if the rent is, let's just say, a thousand dollars a month. OK, uh, no. Well, OK, let's just say five thousand dollars a month. Okay. <laughs> Which is more realistic where we are? Uh, no, okay, yeah, no, okay. I'll make it reasonable. Make it three thousand bucks a month. So, if the rent is three thousand dollars a month, okay, and you accept a vouch a tenant who has a voucher, uh, the 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 housing authority is going to determine what their portion is going to be, what their portion is, and what they're going to pay. So, out of the three thousand dollars a month, the tenant may, based on their income and their family size. Uh, you know, they may, the, the housing authority may determine that they pay a thousand, let's say 800 bucks. That would make it 500 bucks, which is more realistic. So out of the $3,000, the tenant is responsible for 500 bucks, which means that every month, 2,500 bucks is paid by the housing authority to you. So that money is guaranteed the 2,500 and you're responsible for collecting that 500 balance from the tenant. I hope everybody understands that. So the assumption is that the rent is three thousand bucks. Out of that three thousand um, bucks, five hundred dollars is paid by the tenant, which means that twenty five hundred dollars is being paid by the housing authority. That money is guaranteed. It's going to hit your account, come what may. Bad times, good times, hurricanes, whatever it is, is hitting your account on the first or the second or the third, but it's hitting your account early in the month, guaranteed. Okay. Uh, and that's what I like about it. I've been through five real estate cycles and I've been through some cycles and bad times are not good. Uh, you don't want to be the guy standing up when the music stops. It's not it's not pretty uh, downturns. I've been through five of these things. And uh, during downturns, people tend to lose their jobs. And if they lose their jobs, uh, they may not, you may not get your rent, uh, at least with the voucher holders. If they lose their job, uh, your money is still coming in. In fact, it's even better than that. If they lose their jobs, then their income goes down, which means that they can go to the housing authority and uh, request a reduction in their portion. So in the example I just cited, if the tenant's portion is 500, uh, and that's based on their income. So if their income goes down, their portion may go down to 250. 
uh, which means that the government's portion goes up to 2750. I mean, the net rent is still the same 3000, but the proportion, um, you know, between the housing authority and the tenant changes. Um, you know, likewise, if the tenant's income goes up, then their portion is going to go up as well. So, you, I uh, hope that it makes sense. So, uh, so from a financial risk standpoint, it's uh, it's very good for the landlord. Uh, now, uh, they do, as part of the process, uh, program anyway, require that uh, your house meets certain uh, standards in terms of quality condition. They call that housing quality standard, HQS. So uh, before the tenant moves in, they have to do an inspection to make sure it conforms to um, you know, HUD guidelines. And that usually focuses more on the uh, health and safety. Uh, so there's health and safety, uh, you know, inspections that take place. And then every year, or once every two years, uh, the property gets inspected again. So there's some inspections that takes place, um, you know, as part of the, being a participant in the program. But the good thing I like about it is that there's a high demand for, uh, you know, there's a lot of voucher holders out there who, who are having difficulty finding housing. And, and what I found is that, um, you know, I don't know how to say this politically correct, uh, but I, I found that um, there's a lot of families that it's, 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 they're tired of living in crappy houses and crappy neighborhoods and renting from crappy landlords. I mean, I, I don't know how else better to say that. They're just tired of that stuff. I mean, they know slum lords. They're tired of it. They want to live in a decent house in a decent area and rent from a decent landlord. That's what I found. And, uh, and that was the uh, our home are uh, aha moment for me anyway. And uh, there's a lot of families out there who are just yearning for that opportunity. But unfortunately, a lot of landlords, when they hear the word Section 8, they don't want to rent to them because, um, you know, the stereotypes and things like that. So uh, I think that if, you, if you're if you savvy, if you're smart and you figure this thing out, it's really a really good program. And uh, it's definitely something that you may want to consider as part of your, um, you know, uh, your, your, your way moving forward. So let's talk about some action items that you can do uh, based on just the basics, which I've just shared with you. I'm going to do a lot of action items in this discussion today. Uh, I think it's important that you understand some of the basics associated with Section 8. Um, you know, things like, uh, you know, familiarize yourself with the process uh, locally. Uh, how do they determine the rents and who's the housing authority? And, uh, and so on. Prepare to meet, to uh, understand what the housing quality standards are, what uh, the inspectors look for. And uh, also, um, you know, if you've got a property, how are you going to market to uh, attract voucher holders? These are some of the action items based on some of the basics I just talked about. So let me talk about debunking some of the myths uh, associated with this program. I think I kind of shared some of those things. Uh, so the common misconceptions, as I said before, is that, um, you know, uh, a lot of these tenants are going to, you know, destroy your house. A lot of these houses are in crappy neighborhoods. Uh, a lot of these houses, a lot of these tenants don't have pride of, they don't take pride in their home. Uh, they're going to trash your house. Dealing with the housing authorities, the constant bureaucracy, it's just a headache. There's long, lots of red tapes. Um, you know, uh, all the houses, uh, if you got a good house in a good area, you know, you're not going to attract, uh, you know, there's no need to attract voucher holes because they're going to destroy it. So a lot of landlords tend to focus on getting houses in the cheapest part of the town, uh, where they can maximize their cash flow. And, uh, you know, some of these neighbor quote unquote section eight neighborhoods, uh, you know, that's where the dumping ground is uh, for a lot of these voucher tenants. And a lot of these voucher, they're just tired of those living in those crappy neighborhoods, high crime neighborhoods where the kids are not safe and uh, the family's not safe and uh, and so on. I mean, some of the stories I hear when, um, you know, as part of my screening process, it's, it's, it's very sad. Uh, one story that came to mind, comes to mind is that I had a, because a, a, I do a home visit as part of my inspection process. Uh, I recall speaking to one of the uh, prospective tenants of mine. Uh, I went to the home to see how she keeps the house immaculate, spotless. And she was telling me that uh, essentially every day she's worried that her kids will not come home. Uh, they'll get shot dead uh, on the way home from school. That's the concern that she had every day just because of the neighborhood that she's living in. 
and she promised me that if I was to give her a chance to rent my house, uh, I would never regret it. So these are the kind of stories I hear, um, you know, and uh, and to me, that means it's a business opportunity for uh, savvy investors like you and I. So, um, you know, so there's a lot of myths, um, you know, a lot of stereotypes for this program, but uh, once you master it, and uh, it's, it's really good. Now, the question is going to be, how do you master this thing? Uh, obviously, you know, I don't have enough time to, 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 to tell you all the details uh, today. But, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, uh, why recreate the wheel? Uh, I will provide more opportunities to, to drill down further and uh, at future dates. Uh, but I wanted to kind of just give you at least some concepts uh, about that. Another misconception is that the rents that the uh, Housing Authority pays is next to nothing. Uh, that is not always the case uh, in some plots. Um, obviously, it depends on the area that you're in, but many times that they pay market rents. Uh, and sometimes they even pay above market rents. Yes, there are situations where they pay below market, but they are supposed to pay market rents for the properties. And, uh, and you know, once you understand this program, uh, you may be able to, in some situations, get even above market rents for your property. So, you know, you don't have to sacrifice cash flow. Um, it's just that there's, you know, once you understand, you can, you know, use the program to your benefit. So some of the action items associated with some of the debunking the myths, uh, investigate, uh, you know, you know, look into your, uh, your, your misconceptions of the program, uh, explore the different neighborhoods that where you are and, um, uh, you know, contact your housing authority to analyze the rents that they pay and how do they determine the rents? Um, you know, is it zip code, zip code based? Is it neighborhood based? How do they determine, uh, the rents that they pay for, uh, for tenants, uh, in your area? So the next thing I'm going to talk about is financial planning money. Okay. And, uh, so, you know, so I suppose the, the issue here is, uh, how can landlords like you and I optimize, uh, the program, uh, you know, financially to our benefit? And uh, as we know, financial planning is absolute key as investors. Uh, it's all, you know, for a lot of people, it's all about the money. And, uh, you know, and, and what I like about this is that the guaranteed rent portion is very important. As I said before, I've been through five cycles uh, where the economy has tanked uh, or gone down. And it's always good to know that you have every month a certain portion coming in. Also, uh, if you have rent to market renters and they don't pay you for whatever reason, then you get nothing uh, for that month. However, with a voucher holder, at least the tenant's portion paid by, sorry, at least the housing authority's portion, you're going to get that. So there is, this, there is a, a certain level of stability in financially, and you can plan for that uh, each month, regardless of the economic downturn they're in. And regardless of what's going on in the economy. Um, so the other thing is, uh, as I said to you before, as a as a longtime landlord, uh, I, I know that the biggest expense that you and I encounter as landlords is turnover. And uh, turnover can wipe out all your profits. And if you can't figure a way to minimize turnover, I can tell you this, you're not going to make any money. Um, because, uh, you, you don't, uh, each turnover uh, is going to cost you at least one month, possibly two or three months lost income. So if your rent is $3,000 a month, each turnover is going to, after all is said and done, is going to run you around six to $9,000. And that wipes out all the profits that you've made in cash flow for several years. So if you can't control that, I'm telling you, you make no money. Uh, now we can debate that, but that's just the way it is. And a lot of people don't understand that. They think that, oh, all I got to do to make more cash flow is to increase the rents. No, uh, you make more cash flow by reducing your expenses. And, uh, and your biggest expense is uh, turnover and vacancies. So anyway, so, uh, you know, so the thing is that uh, financially, if you can minimize your turnover cost, then most of that cash flow can stay in your pocket. And that's what I like about the Section 8 program is that, uh, you know, you tend to, as I said before earlier on, you tend to get people, or you can, not always, it depends on you as a landlord and how you screen and select and manage the tenant relationship. Uh, you can generally get more uh, tenants that stay longer. 
uh, so you get less turnovers and so on. But yes, you have to put up with the inspections and uh, you have to understand what the inspector is looking for. And sometimes there is damage caused by the tenant, which you as a landlord uh, are requested or required to take care of. But again, that's understanding the program and, uh, and so on. So there are some upfront costs associated with getting this property. Uh, but over the long haul, it makes sense, uh, especially if you're in the appreciating market. Uh, so we're in the appreciating market here in Washington, DC, for example. And uh, I mean, the way it works is that whenever you buy, it's always expensive at that time. Uh, so I recall the first house I bought, believe it or not, I bought, <laughs> you won't believe this, I bought this house for $47,000 in Washington, DC. Uh, this is 37 years ago. And when I bought that house, people were saying I was paying too much. Okay, 47,000. So 10 years later, that house is worth 140. 10 years later, it's worth 340. Now it's this 700, $800,000 neighborhood. So now I say that not to brag because that's not the point. The point is, is that if you live in an appreciating market, prices tend to go up over time. But at the time when you buy it, it's expensive. Like you're buying something today. It's expensive. I get it. Uh, but 5, 10, 15 years later, you look back and say, my God, what was I thinking? I wish I bought this house or that house when it was, quote, cheap. So that's just the way it is. Uh, it's always expensive. And for most part, it's not going to get any cheaper, especially if you play over the long haul. So the issue is how do you get in? And uh, um, once you're in, how do you stay in and, uh, and not uh, lose your shirts or, 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 or get so frustrated that you decide to sell this house? And that's where the systems come in. Uh, that's knowing how to select tenants, how to uh, screen tenants, how to manage the tenant relationships once they're in the home. All these things become very, very important. And, uh, and so again, we don't have time to go into much detail, into all the details about all this, because that's a whole nother session in itself. It's probably, I could spend a, a week uh, drilling down on this stuff, but I just want to give you a high level. Uh, from a financial standpoint, it does make a lot of sense to buy these houses, to hold on to these houses. It builds wealth. You get the benefits of, uh, of real estate from a tax standpoint, cash flow standpoint, equity buildup, generational wealth building. All these are the benefits of owning real estate. And I'm, my position is that, uh, you know, if you want to build wealth, real estate has been proven as a, a vehicle to, um, you know, to build generation wealth and all the benefits associated with that. So you have to know how to buy this stuff. And once you buy, you're going to know how to keep it. Uh, and so on. And I believe that, you know, Section 8 program, participating in the Section 8 program is definitely the way to go. From a tax standpoint, uh, it's a business. So, uh, you know, you are, there are tax benefits uh, associated with real estate investor. But again, I'm not, I'm not an accountant, so you want to speak to your tax advisor uh, on how it's going to impact you. So what are some of the action items uh, from a financial standpoint, or financial management standpoint, I suppose, uh, is, uh, you know, before you buy a house or, you know, look at your portfolio, uh, develop a, what we call a financial model uh, for your investments, and, um, and also look into the tax benefits and tax implications of owning real estate, the financial benefits. Um, it, it's, it, to me, it's not debatable. I mean, I have these debates with my financial planner. I mean, they're always trying to get me to buy more securities and stocks and all this kind of stuff because this guy, he doesn't really understand real estate. Uh, you know, I don't really understand stocks as well, but I do know this is that, uh, you know, there's a, a dire shortage of housing. Uh, I do know this. There's a lot of tenants out there who are looking for quality products, uh, quality housing, and quality neighborhoods, and they desire to rent from quality landlords. That is not going to change uh, through good times and bad times. Uh, it's a given. I think Jeff Bezos was saying that uh, was that uh, if you're going to go to a business, go to a business where the fundamentals are just not going to change. And the fundamentals are everyone's going to need housing. Yes. Uh, however, uh, I don't think there's a, I don't think, I think that there's a great demand for quality houses in quality areas and renting from quality, uh, sorry, tenants are looking for quality housing in quality areas 
and looking to rent from quality landlords. That to me is fundamental. That is not going to change regardless. No tenants are going to tell you I'm looking for a crappy house in a crappy area. Yes. Yeah, so and they're not going to tell you that. So you deal with the fundamentals uh, and then you can wrap a business around it. Uh, and, and these are the fundamentals. It's, it's those things you understand who the customer is, what are they looking for? What are they not looking for? Where they want to live, where they don't want to live, who do they want to rent from, who they don't want to. I mean, these are the fundamentals. And once you take the time to understand those fundamentals, you can then start developing a business around it. And, uh, and that's essentially what I, that's my take, you know, and, uh, it, it's a time-tested formula. It's not going to change, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, fads come and go. And uh, today's fad may be crypto. Tomorrow's fad could be eBay, could be, you know, whatever, Amway or whatever. But the fundamentals don't change. Uh, just like I think Jeff Bezos was saying, people aren't going to say, I want less choices. You know, uh, that's why he has the Amazon store. It has everything. He doesn't feel that there's going to be a situation where people are going to say to him, I want less choices. Uh, people aren't going to tell him, I want my stuff delivered in a longer time. And, and so on. So there's certain fundamentals that uh, don't change. And uh, and I believe that for uh, from a, a housing standpoint, which is the business we're in, if you focus on the fundamentals, you can then start developing the business case around it. Uh, anyway, I have a business background, as you know, so I see things uh, maybe slightly different than many other people. Anyway, we're going to have a Q&A session very shortly. So if you've got some questions, please put them in the uh, chat box. And I'm going to get around to it very shortly and uh, and so on. OK, let's talk about the next thing, which is navigating challenges. Challenges, you're not going to you're not going to avoid them. They're always going to be there. So the issue is going to be. You know, what are the challenges uh, as a Section 8 landlord or a landlord participating in the Section 8 program? And uh, how do you deal with some of those challenges that you're likely to face? So, uh, you know, I've talked about some of the benefits, but there are obviously challenges. And I've been through pretty much every scenario you can think of. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of scenarios. Uh, I, I was talking to one lady yesterday uh, and you know, I hadn't been through her scenario. She had a tenant who was in jail right now. And she's trying to, you know, I don't know, get them out of the house or something while they're in jail. So I haven't ran through that scenario, but uh, I've been through pretty much everything else. Uh, I've had tenants from hell, uh, tenants from heaven. I've had, uh, you know, people lie to me, people trying to rip me off. Uh, and, and so I, I've been through it all. It's, uh, it's, it's an amazing experience. Uh, anyway, uh, some of the challenges. Uh, first thing is that you have the, uh, the the bureaucracy you have to deal with. You're going to have to deal with the housing authority, the local housing authority, wherever you are. Um, you know, it's it's a it's it's a government a a entity, and so with any bureaucracy, there are some red tapes that you have to. Uh, it's relationship based. It's knowing how it works. Uh, it can be very frustrating because sometimes you're dealing with people who, you know, who are overworked and underpaid. And a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of red tapes you have to go through. Um, you know, there's inspections you have to go through. You have to understand the process. Um, you know, these are some of the challenges uh, in terms of dealing with the bureaucracy. You got to know who your housing authority is, how do they determine their rents, and uh, who are the key players in here. You got inspectors, you got caseworkers, you got administrators, you got a whole bunch of people uh, on the government side or the bureaucracy that you have to navigate. And uh, and you have to understand the world from their perspective, because if you can understand the world from their perspective, then you have a better idea of how to actually deal with them, I suppose, uh, and work with them. And uh, but if you take the time, uh, which is what I've done, uh, it, it, it definitely is not so daunting. Uh, that's the that's the, um, the housing authority side. Now, there's the other challenges on the tenant side. Uh, you know, you're going to have to deal with tenants, whether you like it or not. Uh, if you're a housing provider, if you're a landlord, you're going to have to deal with tenants. So whenever you deal with tenants, uh, you're going to have the good, bad and ugly tenants. You're going to have to deal with uh, the court system. Um, hopefully you don't, but you probably will. Um, you know, you're going to have to have to deal with some 
difficult tenants. Uh, I've had my fair share of difficult tenants. Um, you know, you're going to have to deal with, uh, you know, repairs and maintenance, and uh, you're going to deal with tenant screening. You got to have assistance for that. You got to understand the fair housing laws wherever you are, uh, both federally, locally, and state level. Uh, you got to, uh, you're responsible for uh, the property. So if something goes wrong, uh, it's your responsibility to, 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 to fix it and, fi uh, and, and repair, make repairs. Um, you got to be compliant, compliant, uh, compliant with housing standards and fair housing laws. Uh, and so on. So they, these are some of the, 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 the challenges uh, that you're going to have to deal with uh, as a housing provider, whether you deal with Section 8 or not. But there are some nuances. Uh, with a Section 8 program that you have to deal with that you won't have to that you don't have to deal with if you were working uh, or renting to market renters. So there are some challenges, um, but I believe that you know we're all savvy. We can figure it out. Uh, we can understand. It's not too overbearing, over you know, over intimidating. We can figure it out, and I think that uh, these challenges can be overcome, and um, you know, and so on. So it is what it is. You know, you, 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 you know, these are, if you're going to enter the court, as they said, you better know the rules of the game. So educating yourself is, I think, is the key about the realities and the benefits. And also the other thing is to network with other landlords, other people who are seasoned, who are experienced. And, uh, and therefore you learn from their experiences and, uh, and so on. So I think that challenges can be overcome. Uh, there are people out there who have solved the same problem, solved the same problem that you are now encountering and therefore there's no need to recreate the wheel as the saying goes a wise man learns from his mistakes but a genius learns from other people's mistakes so you need to learn from other people's mistakes rather than learn from your mistakes and that way you can get to where you need to go to a lot faster and that you are or you become a genius itself so what are some of the action items associated with challenges uh building a working relationship with your local housing authority um, you know, really put down uh, a, a, or develop a fair or thorough screening process and, uh, and just uh, stay informed about the Section 8 program, the regulations and uh, make the compliance requirements and things like that. And number five, I've got to try and wrap this up because we're getting 733. Uh, building a successful uh, portfolio, I think it's important to talk about that. How do you build a successful portfolio? And uh, how comes that there's some landlords out there who've been able to, um, you know, work Section 8 to their benefits? Uh, how is it that some landlords have been able to develop a portfolio? How did these guys or girls do this? Uh, and, and so on. So that's the issue. And uh, because there are people who are mastering this and, uh, and so on. So building, uh, I think building a successful portfolio requires a strategic approach. And uh, there are risks and you have to balance the risk against the rewards. Um, you know, there are different property types. There are multifamily, single family condos that you can choose. Uh, you can buy in A, B, C, D, E neighborhoods. Uh, you know, that's the choices that you make. And, uh, you know, you could uh, focus in one particular market or you can sort of uh, have a diverse uh, portfolio in different markets. These are choices. And, uh, you know, so that these are some of the things that uh, successful landlords uh, that participate in the program. From my perspective, I think one of the key uh, success factors for me is just understanding who you're trying to attract as a tenant, as a customer. OK, who is your ideal tenant? And uh, in my pers perspective, my ideal tenant, which I, what I call a tier one tenant, is a tenant that's going to pay me the rent, okay? We take care of my property, okay? No drama, okay? And looking for a tenant that's going to stay a long time. So that's my ideal tenant. Now, I don't know who your ideal tenant is. But that's my ideal tenant. Maybe you want the tenant who doesn't pay you. Maybe you don't want it. Maybe you want the tenant who's going to give you nonstop drama. Maybe you want the tenant that's going to trash your house uh and give you non-stop nightmares you know maybe you want tenants that just stay a few months or a few weeks and leave again maybe that's what you want uh and that's okay uh that's not that's not what i want anyway so i know i start off from who do i want and therefore i work backwards from there uh how can i differentiate myself from my competition so i can appeal to those kind of people 
And I work it from that perspective because it's a business and um, every business has customers and successful businesses know what their customers are looking for. And they wrap the entire product around that. Uh, they wrap the whole business model around that. This is just business 101. Uh, and in the housing providing business, your tenant, your customer is your tenant. Okay, the tenant is your customer, sorry. And a lot of landlords, they don't see it that way. They just see the tenants as a means to get paid. Uh, they don't want to see them. They don't want to hear from them. All they want is their money. That's the 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 you know mindset of most uh, landlords, especially Section Eight landlords, and that's the reason why they have a lot of problems. They just take it from the wrong perspective. Uh, I took it from a different perspective, and I've been able to take the time and effort to understand this thing, such that hopefully, um, you know, I work it to my favor. Stay informed. Things change. Um, you know, uh, regulations change, um, you know, laws change and, uh, you know, you need to stay on top of that. You know, you need to network with other landlords who are successful doing this. That's another way to become successful yourself. And, uh, you know, and I think effective property management, because it is a long game. Uh, you know, I think I've done some sessions on how I'm able to get five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 27 year tenants. It is not by accident. It's by a calculated strategy. And, um, you know, again, successful, um, you know, um, investors, um, you know, buy and hold investors anyway, they understand that. And these are some of the things that you want to do. So regular maintenance is also another thing. Uh, customer satisfaction is important. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and making sure that you focus on the needs of your client, the Texan, the Texas the uh the tenant and uh understanding the, the financial uh aspects of your business cash flow uh taxation leveraging the property and so on i mean i got to the point whereby you know after, after a while as the property values increases you can then take the equity from the property and then either get a home equity line or you can do a cash out refinance and uh and buy more properties so one property starts buying more properties and, uh, and and kind of give you a multiplying effect. Uh, okay, so what are the action items here in terms of uh, successful uh, research and identify potential opportunities, uh, uh, potential markets that you may want to uh, invest in, and also network with uh, more experienced seasoned investors, and hopefully you can uh, learn from their ex uh, uh, you know their experiences as well. And the, finally, I want to talk about some of the long term strategies. Um, Hopefully today's session was good. Let me know. Give me some thumbs up, thumb, thumbs up, some feedback. Uh, we're gonna go to Q and A in a second. So, uh, okay, why? Well, what long term strategy should landlords adopt for success in the Section Eight program? Uh, I take a long term view. Uh, at the end of the day, if you take a long term view, you're gonna focus on certain things like sustainability and stability. Okay, this involves uh, you know having high standards of your property. Uh, high standards in terms of the tenants that you deal with, uh, house high standards in terms of your expectations from your tenant, and also high standards uh, from what they expect from you. When I screen my tenant as part of the screening process, I tell them, I mean, you won't believe this, I tell them, uh, I'm looking for the world's greatest tenant, the world's greatest tenant. That's what I'm looking for. And I told you what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone that's going to pay the rent, take care of the property, pleasant to deal with, and looking to stay a long time. That's what I tell them, okay, with a straight face. I said, that's why I'm looking for the world's greatest tent. Now, if that's you, then you'll love renting from me because I'm the world's greatest landlord, okay? I take care of my properties. I'm pleasant to deal with. Most of my tenants stay a long time. That's music to the ears of a lot of these tenants. They're just yearning for a quality landlord, and that's what I'm looking for. So I say that all that. I set expectations in terms of what I expect from them and also let them know what they can expect from me. This is a long-term game. I'm not interested in one-year tenants generally. I'm looking for 5, 10, 15, 20-year tenants. And, uh, you know, so long-term strategies is that, customer service, uh, things like uh, property uh, maintenance is very, very important. Reaching out to tenants on a regular basis is important. Customer service is very important. Uh, prompt repairs is very important. Developing strong relationships uh, with the tenants is critical. 
Uh, at the end of the day, we're dealing with human beings. We're not dealing with quote unquote doors uh, as, as some of these investors are bragging about. I got 50 doors. I got 100 doors. I got 10,000 doors. You know, no, we're dealing with human beings. They're not doors. They're human beings. <laughs> I know it's pretty radical, but uh, if you see people as doors, you're going to treat them that way. If you see them as human beings, you're going to treat them differently. That's how I see them. These are not doors. These are human beings. They got families. They got ex life, you know, expectations. They're yearning for the same things. And, uh, you know, as I, that I'm looking for and, and, you know, and I treat them with respect and courtesy and, um, you know, and so on. So um, that, that's the, these are some of the reasons why they stay a long time. But uh, long term success is all about trying to minimize turnover. And some of those things which I shared with you, I think is important for you. Now, if to me, I like to make money, obviously. Uh, but I also, uh, I really enjoy the fact that I'm making a difference in uh, other people's lives. You know, uh, speaking to one of my tenants a few months ago, you know, just by living in my home in a better house, in a better area, you know, their kids are going to better schools. Some of them are going to college. Some of them got full scholarships to go to college. Um, you know, you've changed the trajectory of people's lives. It's just amazing what you can do, the impact you can have. And, um, you know, if you, you know, if you try to create these win-win scenarios, if you try to make money, but also do good, uh, I love it. I love this business. I love being a landlord to section eight programs, tenants. How about that? I love being a landlord for section eight tenants. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Uh, and so on. Anyway, in conclusion, so what we're going to do, we'll wrap this up. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's a unique opportunity the housing choice voucher program section eight program it's a it's a it's a vehicle for stable uh rental income uh you can make a contribution to other people's lives you can make money you can build generational wealth and uh but you need to understand the intricacies of this program its potential and uh the stability in terms of knowing that every month your money is going to come in guaranteed income that's very very important it's a buffer against uh recessions and downturns and um a market risk it's it, you know you can reduce risks um so uh, i love it i think it's great and uh, i highly recommend that you consider it now i talked a lot uh, there's not you know there's a lot uh, i can continue with but uh, i need to transition over to the q a so let's go to the q a session in a few seconds so if you got some questions please put them in the chat box i'm going to try to uh get to them if you've got to uh reach out to me. You can reach out to me at joe at joeasamoe.com, joe at joeasamoe.com. And uh, I know I've covered a lot. I know you may have a lot of questions. I'm going to try to answer as many as I can uh, in the next 15 minutes. But uh, if you do want to, um, you know, if you feel that I can help you on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, scenario or situation, you may have some issues or questions or, or problems or challenges that you're experiencing. And uh, I do now have set up a mechanism whereby you can schedule one-on-one -on -one uh meetings with me it you do have to pay uh full disclosure it's not free uh it's 175 dollars for one hour uh which is very reasonable and but you'll have my undivided attention uh i'd like to get an understanding of your situation and that way i can provide you some really valuable information uh i've had several of these and uh, one on one they're working out really really well it's a chance for me to get to know you it's a chance for you to get to know me and it's a chance for me to help you on your journey, uh, wherever you are. If anything to the real estate, you can leverage my 35 years worth of experience. So go to my website, uh, www.joesmo.com. www.joesmo.com. There's a button. I think you have to scroll a little bit. It's called Ask Dr. Joe. Ask Dr. Joe. Press that button, and you can schedule uh, one an hour, one hour with me. Uh, at your convenience. I do have some slots uh, and so on. So hopefully I'll speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. But in the meantime, let's get down to business and get some questions, uh, your questions. Uh, I'll try to answer some of these questions. Intellectual conversation with BJ. Hey, Dr. Joe. Uh, tune in from DC. Okay. Welcome. Johnny H. Happy Wednesday. Hey, how, how you doing, Johnny? Uh, Livio Delani. Hi, Dr. Joe. Good. It looks like everyone's in the house. Janice is in, on the fire. Um, uh, Fernando. That's awesome. Okay. Fernando. Uh, are you able to do background credit checks for voucher? Yes, you can. 
uh, it's the same screening process that you normally go through with market renters. You don't have to select anybody. <laughs> I don't select anybody. Uh, I'm trying to get the diamond into the rough. And uh, the way to get your diamond into the rough is to do screening. And my take is that 80% of your problems as a landlord, as a housing provider, you just got the wrong person in your house. That's it. And uh, some people are just the wrong, just the wrong person in your house. And how do you avoid that? You avoid that through screening. I have a very thorough screening process. Uh, it's extremely thorough. And uh, because I'm trying to weed the bad from the good. And uh, I, I, take it from me. It is better to have a place empty uh, than it is to have the wrong person in your house, especially if you live in a, a tenant-friendly jurisdiction like we are living in. So, yes, you can. Uh, real estate won't get cheaper. It definitely will not. Uh, that's what I'm saying. You, It's always expensive. It's expensive today. But I can guarantee you the one thing, uh, folks, 10 years from now, you were kicking yourself thinking, my God, if only I bought in 2024 when it was cheap. That's just the way it plays out. So you just need to get in. Hello, get loved from Texas. How you doing, man? Uh, intellectual conversation with BJ. Uh, Warren Buffett says that he doesn't invest in anything he doesn't understand. Well, uh, I understand real estate. I think most people understand the notion of real estate. It is not complicated at all. It's very, very simple. And most people get it, okay? Especially if you own a house for more than the last 10 years. People get it. You buy an asset, uh, hold on to that asset. You're going to get a mortgage, which means you're going to have to pay somebody uh, the money that you borrowed. Okay. In order to pay that money, you get a tenant. Tenant pays you rent uh, in, you know, for the luxury of staying in your home. You take that money, pay your expenses, and you pocket the difference. Over time, the asset increases in value. It's very, very simple. Most people understand it's not rocket science. Uh, the people don't have to scratch their head about the notion of real estate. That's I, it's it's very simple, and uh, and the bottom line is most of the wealth created in this in the United States is through owning assets like real estate. So that's just the bottom line. Uh, if you want to build wealth, uh, if you want to build up your net worth, uh, you know most people do it through real estate. That's just the way it is. Uh, okay, let's have a look. Uh, Dr. Joe, I have a voucher tenant, rapid rehousing, okay? And his lease is for two people, and he has moved in his nine kids, okay? He is in breach of, but the lease, his lease is up soon. Should I wait it out or evict? Oh, boy, that's a good one. Okay, let's have a look. So let me answer this question. I have a voucher. So he's got a tenant. Now, in D.C., they have lots of different programs. One of them is called rapid rehousing. It's rapid rehousing, the program to... Um, uh, usually people who are homeless uh, or in shelters, uh, the government gives them a, a voucher, a temporary voucher to rent. So rather than being a homeless shelter or on the streets, uh, the government pays uh, for them to be housed by a private landlord. So in, 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 in this person's case, he, he had a, a person who he rented it to lease out the property for two people. And now and he has moved in nine kids. So it's supposed to be two people. There are nine or 11 people in the house. Okay. So obviously he's in breach of his lease. Uh, so it's up to you. I mean, evicted someone in DC is not going to be easy. Um, it's not. It's a very pro tenant jurisdiction. And uh, the time it's going to take you to evict the tenant, you know, uh, it could be lengthy. But, uh, you know, they're, bre they're breaking the lease. And so therefore, to a certain extent, you have to use your judgment. Uh, you're, you're probably getting your money, uh, but they're breaking the lease. So what do you do? Uh, I would say it depends on the situation. Um, one of the things I've learned in real estate as a, as, as a landlord is that you pick your battles. And, uh, you know, so the question is, is this a battle that you want to pick? If they're destroying your house, causing mayhem, and being a, a, a nuisance to neighbors, neighborhood, or whatever it is, then maybe it is worthwhile to evict them. Uh, if they're taking care of your property, they're respectful, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and all the other stuff, yeah, and there's no drama going on, and they're taking care of your house, then maybe, I don't know, uh, yeah, they're breaking the law technically. You do have the right to evict them technically, but is that a battle you want to take? It's up to you. 
Uh, I, I say just pick your battles. You know the situation better than I do. It sounds like it's a pretty complicated situation. Uh, this could be a situation with the intellect BJ, I suppose, uh, where we could do a one on one because I've been through this before. And, uh, and I, I think that, uh, you know, you, you've got some decisions that you have to make and you've got some tough choices that you may have to uh, decide on. And uh, I've had I've been through these those tough scenarios, so I think that could be a candidate for a one on one, uh, BJ. So check you know if 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 you feel that uh, you know you want that one on one, please uh, reach out to me. Uh, go to my website www.joasmo and to schedule the one on one. Ask Dr. Joe. Frank, hey Mr. Frank, uh, I know there was an effort in DC to adjust the payment schedules to landlords. Did things actually change? Yes, particularly for the houses with five bedrooms or more. Yes. So what, Frank's, uh, how you doing, Frank? Frank, long time no speak. Uh, if you want a, a good uh, appraiser, reach out to Mr. Frank uh, John at uh, Washington. I think Washington Appraisers, I think uh, John's at. He's, he's a good guy. Anyway, yeah, in July of last year, uh, they changed the, uh, the payment standards uh, for Section 8. And uh, they went from a neighborhood neighborhood based model to a um, uh, a comparable based or market based model, and so it's changed. Uh, you know, like all things, the rules have changed, and so you have to understand the new rules, uh, and then you play accordingly. I have a better understanding how this uh, new how the rules are now, and I'm playing to win. So uh, yes, yeah, so there are definitely winners and losers out of all this uh and some rents have gone down in some areas and some rents have gone up in certain areas and uh especially if you've got four five and six bedrooms so it it it, it depends um but i have a better idea how it works uh and uh i'm playing to win so that's all i can say about that one and we can talk offline about how to win this game uh but uh yeah the rules have changed and uh the old model neighborhood model doesn't work anymore well, they're not using that model anymore, uh, but that's okay. It is what it is. I've uh, been there, done that, seen that before. Michael, uh, what can you do in, in your property to get a higher fair market rent? What can you do in your property? Well, there, for Section 8, the rent is based on two things and two things alone. Uh, it's based on the number of bedrooms that you have in your house and the location of your property. Uh, what, you know, again, depends on what the jurisdiction uses uh, to determine rents. It could be zip code based, neighborhood based or whatever, uh, market based. So there, there are certain criterias that they use. This is a housing authority to determine uh, the fair market rents, FMR. So you need to understand that for your jurisdiction because it changes. And uh, once you understand how they determine rents, then you can then, you know, uh, you know play accordingly. Uh, you know, they're not going to change the rules for you, uh, but you're going to have to understand how the rules are. And then you play the, you know, you, you work it to your advantage. That's all I can say about that. Uh, sometimes there are gray areas and, uh, you know, sometimes they say, well, if you got the following amenities, we may give you more money, uh, and, and so on. And you can't just like, uh, you know, have a small house and say, well, I want to make uh, eight bedrooms here. Uh, and every bedroom is the size of a closet. They're not going to allow it. So, you know, yeah, technically you're saying it's an eight bedroom and therefore you can get eight bedroom rents, but you're not going to get a higher rent because uh, five of those bedrooms are legal bedrooms. So uh, uh, the point I'm trying to get to is that there are certain things that you can do. Uh, understand how the local authority, housing authority determines rents in your area. And, uh, and then... Uh, once you understand that, uh, you know, then you can then, uh, you know, act accordingly. I mean, I, there's no other way to explain it than to say, before you get onto the court, know the rules of the game. Because if you go onto the basketball courts wearing soccer cleats, you're not going to win. It's, it just doesn't work that way. If you're going to go play basketball, you get on with basketball shoes and make sure you, you understand the rules of basketball because then you stand a chance of winning. Without that understanding, you're you're destined to fail. So that's what I'm saying, uh, Mike, is that that you know I I take the position that you can win in this game, this real estate game, but please before you get onto the court, 
uh, learn from other people who are also winning. So that way you stand a better chance of winning. Okay, Fang. Uh, hi, Dr. Joe. How do you pick a good market for Section 8? I live in an expensive area that forces me to invest far away, and I don't know what to look for to decide a good market for Section 8. Thank you. Good question, Fang. Uh, what's the time? 7.50. Oh, my goodness. We've got so many questions. I, don't think, I think I'm going to have to do a part two for this thing because I've only got about three or four minutes left. Uh, uh, how do you pick a good market? Well, I like to – I live in the Washington, D.C. area. It's an expensive market as well. And uh, I'm not interested in buying in houses areas. I, I don't. It's far away. I just like to buy local. So I had I had to figure out how to make this work in this market where I'm in. And so I just take the time. So wherever you are, Fang, there are people out there who are playing this game and winning. There are there are successful uh, real estate investors that are doing Section Eight wherever you are, uh, whichever market you're in. There are people already winning. The issue is what are they doing? uh that that's making them win you know and i think that if you take the time to find these people and learn from them um you know i mean if you're in the washington dc area i mean i know how to i know how to make this thing work for you uh so you know if you're interested in the washington dc market i mean i'm as good as anybody to talk to and i can tell you how how it works and how I, I use it, uh, how I've been able to to leverage this program uh, to buy houses and get cash flow in areas where, you know, you can't buy anything over here for less than half a million dollars, nothing. Uh, and that half a million dollars probably needs a lot of work. So that's just the way we are here. And But I've been able to figure out how to make it work and get, still get cash flow. And so on. So I think the same thing can happen. You don't have to go to the other side of the country. You don't have to go long distance. You are where you are. Uh, and the issue is, uh, how do you make it work where you are? You know, I think there's a story, the acres of diamonds. You know, the grass is always greener on the other side somewhere else uh, until you get there. And then you realize, uh, you know, it's the same old, same old. Uh, there's no nirvana. You have to create your own opportunities wherever you are. Uh, and that's that's how I see it anyway. Good question, though. Uh, La Quinta, uh, how often do you visit your property with tenants who reside in there? Initially, it's every three months uh, for the first year. And then after that, once I get to know the tenants and the, how they keep the home, you can scale back on that one. Zach, can you go over getting the rent increase on it? Can you go over getting a rent increase on an existing tenant? Yes. Uh, depending on where you are, you can request uh, a rent increase. Uh, so you have to understand how they determine rent increases where you are. So in the Washington DC, you have to petition the housing authority. You have to give the tenant notice, um, you know, 60 days or 30 days, depending on where you are. And then you give them notice, you apply, um, you submit that information to the housing authority. They review it. Uh, they may approve it. They may deny it, or they may counter your increase. And uh, and so on. So that's at a high level. Each particular jurisdiction will have their own different rules. But at a high level, typically you have to give notice to your tenant. You then have to inform the housing authority. You have to uh, be in good standing with the housing authority. And your rent that you're asking has to be uh, within the, the fair market rent guidelines. And, you know, if it does, then they may approve it. If it doesn't, they will definitely not approve it or they may counter your increase. So you may be asking for hundred dollars. They may counter and say, well, we can offer you 50. Uh, and then it's, you know, many times it's take it or leave it, or you can do some more haggling there. How is this in the home inspection process? Uh, thanks for today's lesson. Uh, they have what we call housing quality standards. It's, uh, uh, it's a process where they check for mainly health and safety. They check all the doors, the windows, uh, the outlets, the plumbing, the electrical, uh, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors. Uh, they check to make sure that uh, there's egress, uh, forms of egress, to make sure that the bedrooms are legal. There's a whole bunch of stuff that they check. Um, so before an inspection, I usually go through the property, uh, to make, especially if it's new, to make sure that uh, it's going to pass. And uh, if it's a, a tenant's in the house, then I usually, uh, you know, let the tenants know that uh, there's going to be uh, an inspection, and we work something out for them to incentivize. I incentivize them to pass. Shana, 
how you doing? Hope all is well on your side. Uh, Shane Bagley, nice talking to you. Uh, hope all is well with you anyway. Uh, Livio, uh, do you believe we should be investing in this current market? Dark clouds ahead of me, kind of. Look, there's no, there's no, uh, the stars are never aligned. You just buy. If you take a long term view of these things, uh, the best time to buy is now. Well, in fact, the best time to buy was yesterday or 10 years ago. Uh, but that's too late. So the best time to buy is today, especially if you have a long term view. Now, if you have a short term view, maybe there's the clouds that are definitely coming. And, uh, but at some point, the clouds will go away. We'll go through different market cycles, and uh, it is what it is. So the best time to buy is, is now. Uh, how does the newbie proceed with a good off-market pack? I'm going to have to wrap this up because it's 8 o'clock. We've had a lot of good questions. Uh, so uh, if you if you felt that today was good, uh, please, uh, maybe, you know, we can do another session on Section 8. Uh, or may, I may just do another session just on questions. Ask Dr. Joe. Uh, and so on. So we got a lot of questions here. I, I've, I've got no chance of getting to them. Uh, so we're going to have to wrap it up because it's eight o'clock. And uh, but let me, before I wrap it up, I just want to let you know that uh, if there's anything I can do, uh, you know, please feel free to reach out to me, uh, Joe at joeasimo.com, Joe at joeasimo.com. And if uh, if if you feel that I can be of assistance to you, if you got a, a real estate related question or problem or situation where you feel that I can help you. Uh, we can schedule a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with me. Go to my website, www.joeasimo.com, and scroll down. You'll see Ask Dr. Joe. Ask Dr. Joe. Press the button, and you can then schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me. There is a fee. It's $175 for one hour, full disclosure. Uh, but for everyone that's done it, I've had quite a few people. The the, the, the value I provided is, is a multiple of that. So my goal just the way I am. If you spend a dollar with me, my goal is to get you two or three dollars back. So um, in the scheme of things, uh, $175 is definitely uh, value well spent, especially if you have a situation whereby it's racking your brain and giving, stressing you out. And uh, we all go through that. I've been through 35 years of that. So leverage my skills, leverage my experiences. There's no need to recreate the wheel. So on behalf of myself, I hope today's session was a good session. Uh, I think uh, I, you know, I just can't get through all the questions. We've got a lot of questions today, so maybe we'll do a separate session uh, just on Q and A. So again, uh, see me. I'll hope I'll see you next Wednesday. Uh, we'll have another different topic, and I'll probably do another section eight at another time, and uh, and so on. So until next Wednesday, seven p.m. Eastern time. Have a great evening. Take care. Bye for now.